Before development of the modern theories about risk in return, financial managers always knew that risky projects are less valuable than safe projects. Thus, they demanded higher rates of return from risky projects or accounting for the risk of these projects through more conservative forecasts of projected cash flows. Modern organizations make use of company cost of capital or firm cost of capital as benchmark of risk adjusted discount rate for investing in new projects. The company cost of capital is the right discount rate only for investments that have the same risk as the company's overall business. For riskier projects, the opportunity cost of capital is greater than the company cost of capital. For safer projects, it is less. The company cost of capital is usually estimated as a weighted average cost of capital, that is, as the average rate of return demanded by investors in the company's debt and equity. The hardest part of estimating the weighted average cost of capital is figuring out the cost of equity, that is, the expected rate of return to investors in the firm's common stock. Many firms turn to capital asset pricing model like CAPM for this answer. The CAPM states that expected return equals the risk-free interest rate plus a risk premium that depends on beta and the market risk premium. Also, CAPM requires estimates of beta that are computed using historical stock market returns. Now, assume that you are evaluating a project to estimate its cost of capital. You need to know if the project is average risk or above or below average risk. You need to check whether the project's cash flows are more or less sensitive to business cycle than the average project. You also need to check whether the project has higher or lower fixed operating costs, that is higher or lower operating leverage, and whether it requires large future investments. Also, please remember that a project's cost of capital depends only on market risk. Diversifiable risk can affect project cash flows but does not increase the cost of capital. Often we add fudge factors to account for discount rates. These fudge factors often introduce noise and incorrect valuations. Project risk varies over time for a given project. For example, a project is riskier and often loss making in young early stage while safe and cash flow positive at maturity. However, very often while estimating discount rates, managers consider them constant that is same in all the financial years. Financial managers usually assume that project risk will be the same in every future period and they use a single risk adjusted discount rate for all the future cash flows. Company and project cost of capital. We'll discuss the company cost of capital and how a firm should estimate the cost of capital for individual projects. The company cost of capital is defined as the expected return on a portfolio of all the company's existing securities. It is the opportunity cost of capital for investment in the firm's assets and therefore the appropriate discount rate for the firm's average risk projects. If the firm has no debt outstanding, then the company cost of capital is just the expected rate of return on the firm's stock. The company cost of capital is not the correct discount rate if the new projects are more or less risky than the firm's existing business. Each project should in principle be evaluated at its own opportunity cost of capital. This is clear implication of the value additive principle. For a firm composed of assets A and B, the firm value is firm value equal to present value of AB combined equal to present value of A plus present value of B that is sum of separate asset values is the sum of combined. Here PV of A and PV of B are valued just as if they were mini firms in which stockholders could invest directly. Investors would value A by discounting its cash flows at a rate reflecting the risk of A. They would value B by discounting at a rate reflecting the risk of B. The two discount rates will in general be different. If the present value of an asset depend on the identity of the company that bought it, present values would not add up and we know they do add up. Consider a portfolio of $1 million invested in firm A and $1 million invested in firm B. Would any reasonable investor say that the portfolio is worth anything more or less than $2 million? If the firm considers investing in a third project C, it should also value C as if C were mini firm. That is, the firm should discount the cash flows of C at the expected rate of return that investors would demand if they could make a separate investment in C. The opportunity cost of capital depends on the use to which that capital is put. Think of a project company A that has a massive healthcare and consumer products line and established consumer base. A new division with different risk profile, considerable uncertainty and customer demand 
that is yet to be established should of course have different cost of capital however estimating that cost of capital for a new project or business would be challenging suppose we measure the risk of each project by its beta then a firm should accept any project lying above the upward sloping security market line that links expected return to risk if the project is high risk the firm needs a higher prospective return than if the project is low risk that is different from the company cost of capital rule which accepts any project regardless of its risk as long as it offers a higher return than the company cost of capital the company co cost of capital rule tells the firm to accept any project above the horizontal line of capital line as shown in the figure here that is any project offering a return of more than 3.8% a comparison between the company cost of capital rule and the required return from the capital asset pricing model rule shows and as provided in this figure the firm's company cost of capital is about 3.8% This is the correct discount rate only if the project beta is 0.50. In general, the correct discount rate increases as the project beta increases. The firm should accept projects with rates of return above the security market line relating required return to beta. It is clearly silly to suggest that the firm should demand the same rate of return from a very safe project from a very risky one. If the firm used the company cost of capital rule, it would reject many good low risk projects and accept many high risk poor projects. It is also silly to suggest that just because another company has a low company cost of capital, it is justified in accepting projects that the company would reject. The true cost of capital depends on project risk, not on the company undertaking the project. So why is it is so much time spending? in estimating the company cost of capital there are two reasons first many and maybe most projects can be treated as average risk projects that is neither more nor less risky than the average of the company's other assets for these projects the company cost of capital is the right discount rate second the company cost of capital is a useful starting point for setting discount rates for unusually risky or safe projects it is easier to add to or subtract from the company cost of capital than to estimate each project's cost of capital from scratch business people have good intuition about relative risks at least in industries they are used to but not about absolute risk or required rates of return therefore they set a company wide cost of capital as benchmark this is not the right discount rate for everything the company does but adjustments can be made for more or less risky ventures that said we have to admit that many large companies use the company cost of capital not just as benchmark but also as an all purpose discount rate for every project proposal measuring differences in risk is difficult to do objectively when firms force the use of a single company cost of capital risk adjustments shift from the discount rate to project cash flows top management may demand extra conservative cash flow forecasts from extra risky projects they may refuse to sign off an extra risky project unless npv that is computed at the company cost of capital is well above zero however such rough and ready risk adjustments are better than none at all To summarize in this video we discussed that company cost of capital is an appropriate discount rate as the appropriate opportunity cost of investing in the firm's assets that is the appropriate discount rate for average risk projects however if the projects are more riskier than the average firm risk they should be discounted at appropriate rates that reflect the risk of these projects that is estimated using models such as capm companies often use conservative cash flow forecasts for risky projects however the appropriate approach requires them to use cost of capital which is efficient but difficult to estimate computing company cost of capital we discuss the computation of the company cost of capital or weighted average cost of capital 
we defined the company cost of capital as the expected return on a portfolio of all the company's existing securities. That portfolio usually includes debt as well as equity. Thus, the cost of capital is estimated as a blend of the cost of debt, that is the interest rate and the cost of equity, the expected rate of return demanded by investors in the firm's common stock. Consider a balance sheet of firm based on market values as shown here, where asset value of 100, which is the total value of asset, that is 100, debt D equal to 30 at 7.5% cost and equity E equal to 70 at 15% cost. So the firm value on the liability side is also equal to 100. The values of debt and equity add up to the overall firm value that is D plus E equal to V and firm value V equals asset value here. These figures are all market values, not book or accounting values. The market value of equity is often larger than the book value. So the market debt ratio debt by value D by V is often much lower than a debt ratio computed from the book balance sheet. The 7.5% cost of debt is the opportunity cost. The 7.5% cost of debt that is the opportunity cost of capital for investors who hold the firm's debt. The 15% cost of equity is the opportunity cost of capital for the investors who hold the firm's shares. Neither measures the company cost of capital, that is the opportunity cost of investing in the firm's assets. The cost of debt is less than the company cost of capital because debt is safer than the assets. The cost of equity is greater than the cost of capital because the equity of a firm that borrows is riskier than the assets. Equity is not a direct claim on firm's free cash flow, it is a residual claim that stands behind the debt. The company cost of capital is not equal to the cost of debt or to the cost of equity but is a blend of the two. Suppose you purchase a portfolio consisting of 100% of the firm's debt and 100% of its equity then you would own 100% of its assets lock stock and barrel. You would not share the firm's fee cash flow with anyone. Every dollar that the firm pays out would be paid to you. The expected rate of return on your hypothetical portfolio is the company cost of capital. The expected rate of return is just a weighted average of the cost of debt that is RD equal to 7.5% and the cost of equity that is R equal to 15%. The weights are the relative market values of the firm's debt and equity that is D by V equal to 30% and E by V equal to 70%. Also, Please notice if the marginal corporate tax rate that is TC equal to 35% then after tax weighted average cost of capital that is VAT or company cost of capital can be computed as shown here. For example, WACC or company cost of capital equal to RD into 1 minus TC into D by V plus RE into EYB equal to 7.5% into 1 minus 0.35 into 0 0.30 plus 15 into 0.70 equal to 12 percent. This blended measure of company cost of capital is called the weighted average cost of capital. To summarize, in this video we discussed how to compute company cost of capital or VAC using cost of debt, cost of equity, taxes and debt and equity proportions in market value terms. For a firm, while cost of equity was considered as given in these computations, in subsequent videos, we will also examine the estimation of cost of equity. Estimating the components of VAC that is weighted average cost of capital. We will discuss the estimation of the components of VAC that is risk free rate, beta and risk premium. We will also discuss the estimation of asset beta, a measure of the risk of company assets. To calculate the weighted average cost of capital, you need an estimate of the cost of equity. We will use the capital asset pricing model that is CAPM to estimate the cost of equity. As per CAPM, expected returns equal to RF that is risk free rate plus beta times RM minus RF. RM here is expected returns on market and RM minus RF is the risk premium. Let us start by estimating beta. In principle, we are interested in the future beta of the company stock. However, we will estimate beta using historical security price data. 
In the scatter diagram shown here, each dot represents the return on a security and return on market. The slope of fitted line, that is line fitted using ordinary least square regression, that is OLS, is called beta. That is how much on average the stock prices change when the market change by 1%. The R square measure tells us the proportion of total variance that can be explained by market variance. That is the risk of security that is on account of market risk or systematic part of risk. It appears that 29.7% of the variance was explained by the market. That is out of the total risk of the security, 29.7% was on account of market risk and remaining was on account of stock specific risk or idiosyncratic risk or what we called as diversifiable risk. The noise in this returns can obscure the true beta. Therefore, statisticians calculate the standard error of the estimate beta to show the extent of possible mismeasurement. Then they set up a confidence interval of the estimated value plus or minus two standard errors. For example, in this case, standard error of beta estimate is 0.436. Thus, the 95% confidence interval estimate, that is 2.16 plus minus 2 into 0.436, this is the interval that you have 95% chance of being right in saying that beta can fall in this interval. There is always a large margin. There is always a large margin of error when estimating the beta for individual stocks. Fortunately, the estimation errors tend to cancel out when you estimate betas of portfolios. That is why financial managers often turn to industry betas that is betas of portfolios of securities from the same industry. The next issue is what value to use for the risk free interest rate. Should we use short term treasury bill rate, daily overnight rate, monthly rate, one year interest rate or long term interest rates. These rates are to be used in CAPM. CAPM here is a short term model. It works period by period and calls for a short term interest rate. But could a 0.2% 3 month risk free rate give the right discount rate for cash flows from 10 to 20 years in the future? Financial managers muddle through this problem in one of the two ways. Either they first simply use a risk free long term rate in the CAPM formula. If this shortcut is used, then the market risk premium must be restated as the average difference between market returns and returns on long term treasuries. The second way retains the usual definition of the market risk premium as the difference between the market returns and returns on short term treasury bill rates. But now you have to focus the expected return from holding treasury bills over the life of the project. We know that investors require a risk premium for holding long term bonds rather than bills. To get a rough but reasonable estimate of the expected long term return from investing in treasury bills, we need to subtract the difference in premium between long term government bonds and T bills, that is 1.5%, assuming the T bill rate is 1.5%, from the current yields on the long term bonds, assuming that is 3.3%. In this case, expected long term return on bills will be equal to yield on long term bonds minus 1.5%, which will be equal to 3.3 minus 1.5 equal to 1.8 percent. This is a plausible estimate of the expected average future return on treasury bills. If the market risk premium is 7 percent, beta is 1.16, then the cost of equity can be computed as follows. Cost of equity equal to expected returns that is equal to RF plus beta times RM minus RF which is equal to 1.8 plus 1.16 into 7 that is equal to 9.9 percent. Let us calculate the VAC for a firm with cost of debt about 7.8%, corporate tax rate of 35% and debt to value ratio of 31.5%. The after tax VAC for this firm will be equal to 1 minus TC into RD into D by V plus RE into E by V, which is equal to 1 minus 0.35 into 7.8 into 0.315 plus 9.9 .9 into 0.685 equal to 8.4%. Thus, the firm should set its cost of capital estimates to 8.4%. The cost of debt is always less than the cost of equity. The VAT formula blends 
these two costs. The formula is dangerous, however, because it suggests that average cost of capital could be reduced by substituting cheap debt for expensive equity. It doesn't work that way. As the debt ratio d by v increases, the cost of the remaining equity also increases, offsetting the apparent advantage of more cheap debt. Debt does have a tax advantage, however, because interest is a tax deductible expense. That is why we use the after tax cost of debt in the after tax VAC. The after tax VAC depends on the average risk of a company's assets, but it also depends on taxes and financing. It is easier to think about project risk if you measure it directly. The direct measure is called the asset beta. We calculate this asset beta as a blend of separate betas of debt and equity. For example, let us consider a security with beta e equal to 1.16 and beta d equal to 0.3. The weights are the fractions of debt and equity financing that is debt by value equal to 0.315 and equity by value equal to 0.685. Asset beta here, beta A equal to beta D times D by V plus beta E times E by V equal to 0 0.3 into 0 0.315 plus 1.16 into 0 0.685 which is equal to 0 0.89. Calculating the asset beta is similar to calculating a weighted average cost of capital. The debt and equity weights that is D by V and E by V are the same. The logic is also the same. Suppose you purchased a portfolio consisting of 100% of firm's equity and 100% of its debt, then you would own 100% of its assets lock, stock and barrel and the beta of your portfolio would be equal to the beta of these assets. That is weighted average of these assets. The portfolio beta is of course just a weighted average of the betas of debt and equity. This asset beta is an estimate of the average risk of a firm's business. It is a useful benchmark, but it can take you only so far. Not all investments of the firm will be of the same average risk. And if you are the first to use railroad track network as an interplanetary transmission antennas, you'll have no asset betas to start with. How can you make informed judgments about cost of capital for projects or lines of business when you suspect that risk is not average? It is unique. To summarize, in this video, we discussed the estimation of the components of CAPM model. First, we estimated company beta by regressing the security returns on market returns. The slope of regression line represented the company beta, that is the sensitivity of the security to market movements. Next, we discussed the estimation of risk fee rates. Though there are different ways to estimate the same, one can estimate the difference between current government bond yields and short term T bill rates as the risk fee interest rate that would represent the cost of holding long term government securities. Next, the estimates of expected market returns and risk fee rates can be used for estimation of risk premium. Analyzing project risk. We'll discuss how to analyze project risk. In this backdrop, we'll also examine the role of asset betas. Suppose that a coal mining corporation wants to discuss the risk of investing in commercial real estate. For example, in a new company headquarters, The asset beta for coal mining is not helpful. You need to know the beta of real estate. For the same, we have to turn to securities of real estate firms that are getting traded in financial markets. These would serve as a traded comparables for the proposed office building. A company that wants to set a cost of capital for one particular line of business typically looks for pure plays in that line of business. Pure play companies are firms that specialize in one activity. For example, suppose that Schlumberger wants to set a cost of capital for its new oil exploration venture. It could also estimate the average cost of beta or cost of capital for oil and gas firms that have not diversified into multiple business lines such as Reliance. Overall, company cost of capital are almost useless for conglomerates. Conglomerates diversify into several unrelated industries. So they have to consider industry specific cost of capital. They therefore look for pure plays in the relevant industries. Consider Reliance Group for example. The group combines many different companies into different businesses including media, software, oil and gas, retail, telecom among others. So it is not a pure play. However, if you look at ONGC, it is a large company purely into oil and gas exploration. 
The trick is picking the comparables with business risks that are almost similar to Schlumberger's new oil and gas exploration venture. Sometimes good comparables are not available or are not good match to a particular project. Then the financial manager has to exercise his or own her judgment and the following considerations are made. Think about the determinants of asset betas. Often the characteristic of a high or low beta assets can be observed when the beta itself cannot be. Next, don't be fooled by the diversifiable risk. Third, avoid fudge factors. Don't give in to the temptation to add fudge factors to the discount rate to offset things that could go wrong with the proposed investment. Adjust cash flow forecast first. Next, we try to answer the question what determines asset betas? First, cyclicality. Many people intuition associates risk with the variability of earnings or cash flows, but much of this variability reflects diversifiable risk. Loan prospectors searching for gold look forward to extremely uncertain future outcome. But whether they strike it rich is unlikely and depends on the performance of market portfolio. Even if they do go find gold, they do not bear much market risk. Therefore, an investment in gold prospecting has a high standard deviation but a relatively low beta. What really counts is the strength of the relationship between the firm's earnings and the aggregate earnings on all real assets. We can measure this either by the earnings beta or by the cash flow beta. These are just like a real beta except that changes in earnings or cash flows are used in place of rates of return on securities. We would predict that firms with high earnings or cash flow betas should also have high asset betas. This means that cyclical firms, firms whose revenue and earnings are strongly dependent on the state of the business cycle, tend to be high beta firms. Thus, you should demand a higher rate of return from investments whose performance is strongly tied to the performance of the economy. Examples of cyclical businesses include airlines, luxury resorts and restaurants, construction and steel. Much of the demand for steel depends on construction and capital investment. Examples of less cyclical businesses include food and tobacco products and pharmaceutical products. Next, we come to operating leverage. A production facility with high fixed costs related to variable costs is said to have high operating leverage. High operating leverage means a high asset beta. Let us see how this works. The cash flow generated by an asset can be broken into revenue, fixed costs and variable costs. That is cash flow equal to revenue minus fixed costs minus variable costs. Costs are variable if they depend on the rate of output. Examples are raw material costs, sales commissions and some labor and maintenance costs. Fixed costs are cash flows that occur regardless of whether the asset is active or idle. For example, property taxes or the wages of workers under contract. We can break down the asset's present value in the same way like present value of asset equal to present value of revenue minus present value of fixed cost minus present value of variable cost. Or equivalently we can say present value of revenue equal to present value of fixed cost plus present value of variable cost plus present value of assets. Those who receive the fixed cost are like debt holders in the project. They simply get a fixed payment. Those who receive the net cash flows from the assets are like holders of common stock. They get whatever is left after payment of the fixed cost. We can now figure out how the assets beta is related to the betas of the values of revenues and costs. The beta of PV revenue, that is present value of revenues, is a weighted average of the betas of its component parts, that is beta revenue equal to beta fixed cost times PV of fixed cost upon PV of revenue plus beta of variable cost into PV of variable cost upon PV of revenue plus beta asset into PV variable upon PV revenue. The fixed cost beta should be zero. Whosoever receives the fixed cost receives a fixed stream of cash flows. The betas of the revenues and variable costs should be approximately the same because they respond to the same underlying variable that is rate of output. Therefore, we can substitute beta revenue or beta variable cost and solve for the asset beta. Remember, we are assuming beta fixed cost equal to zero. Also, PV revenue minus PV variable cost equal to PV asset plus PV of fixed cost. Beta asset equal to beta revenue into PV of revenue minus PV of variable cost upon PV asset 
which is also equal to beta revenue times 1 plus PV of fixed cost upon PV of asset. Thus, given the cyclicality of revenues as reflected in beta revenue, the asset beta is proportional to the ratio of the present value of fixed cost to the present value of the project. Other things being equal, the alternative with the highest ratio of fixed cost to project value will have the higher project beta. Also, don't be fooled by the diversifiable risk. We have defined risk as the asset beta for a firm, industry or project. But in everyday usage, risk simply means bad outcome. People think of the risk of a project as a list of things that can go wrong. For example, a geologist looking for oil worries about the risk of a dry hole. A pharmaceutical company scientist worries about the risk that a new drug will have unacceptable side effects and so on. Notice that these risks are all diversifiable risks. These hazards do not affect asset betas and should not affect the discount rate for the projects. Sometimes financial managers increase discount rates in an attempt to offset these risks. This makes no sense. Diversifiable risk should not increase the cost of capital. A simple example can be considered. A project Z that produces just one cash flow forecasted at $1 million a year at the end of year 1. It is regarded as average risk project suitable for discounting at a 10% company cost of capital and therefore present value PV equal to C1 upon 1 plus R which is equal to 1 lakh upon 1.1 which is 10 lakh upon 1.1 which is equal to 9 lakh 9100. But now you discover that the company's engineers are behind the schedule in developing the technology required for the project. They are confident it will work but they admit to a small chance that it will not. You still see the most likely outcome as 1 million dollars. But you also see some chance that the project Z will generate zero cash flow next year. The appropriate way to deal with the situation is to prepare unbiased cash flow forecast that give due weight to all possible outcomes favorable as well as unfavorable. Managers making unbiased forecasts are correct on average, but sometimes their forecast may turn high and sometimes low. But their errors will average out over many projects. If you forecast a cash flow of $1 million for a project like Z, you will overestimate the average cash flow. You will overestimate the average cash flow because every now and then you will hit a zero. Those zeros should be averaged into your forecast. Let us write the projected cash flows in probability terms. And the unbiased forecast is the probability weighted average cash flows or expected cash flows as shown here in the table. This might describe the initial prospects of project Z, but if technological uncertainty introduces a 10% chance of zero cash flow, the unbiased forecast could drop to 9 lakh dollars as shown in the table here. And therefore, the new present value computation would be present value PV equal to 0 0.90 upon 1.1, which is equal to 0 0.818 million dollars. Managers often work out a range of possible outcomes for major projects, sometimes with explicit probabilities attached. But even when outcomes and probabilities are not explicitly written down, the manager can still consider the good and bad outcomes as well as the most likely one. When the bad outcomes outweigh the good, the cash flow forecast should be reduced until the balance is regained. Step 1 then is to do your best to make unbiased forecasts of a project's cash flows. Unbiased forecasts incorporate all risks including diversifiable risks as well as market risks. Step 2 is to consider whether diversified investors would regard the project as more or less risky than the average project. In this step, only market risks are relevant. Here, we should note an important point to avoid fudge factors in discount rates. Think back to our example of project Z where we reduced forecasted cash flows from 1 million to 9 lakh dollars to account for a possible failure of technology. The project's present value that is PV was reduced from 9,9100 to 8,18,000. You could have gotten the right answer by adding a fudge factor to the discount rate and discounting the original forecast of $1 million. But you have to think through the possible cash flows to get the fudge factor. And once you forecast the cash flows directly and correctly, you do not need the fudge factor. Fudge factors in discount rates are dangerous because they disappear and displace the clear thinking about the future cash flows.
to summarize in this video we discussed the estimation of cost of capital for a project with a risk that is different from the average risk of the firm for the same it is often useful to look for pure play companies with the same risk as that of the project in this backdrop often the asset betas are used to understand the risk of the project these asset betas are primarily affected by the variability of earnings or cash flows and operating leverage also the diversifiable component of risk should not be considered for estimating the asset beta and finally with the help of a simple yet interesting example we examine how to value these uncertain risky project cash flows and account for the dynamic nature of the risk that changes as time passes certainty equivalents we'll discuss the concept of certainty equivalents first we work through an example showing what certainty equivalents are then we use certainty equivalents to uncover what you are really assuming when you discount a series of future cash flows at a single risk adjusted discount rate we also value a project when risk changes over time and ordinary discounting fails in practical capital budgeting a single risk adjusted discount rate is used to discount all future cash flows this assumes that project risk does not change over the time and remains constant year in and year out we note that this cannot be strictly true for this the risk that companies are exposed to are constantly shifting we are venturing here onto something difficult ground but there is a way to think about risk that can suggest a route through it involves converting the expected cash flows to certainty equivalents you discount at a risk adjusted discount rate of 5 plus 1 into 7 equal to 12 percent rather than the 5 percent risk free rate of interest this gives a present value of 4 lakh 20 thousand divided by 1.12 equal to 3 lakh 75 thousand dollars suppose a real estate company now approaches you and offers a fixed price at which it will buy the building from you at the end of the year this guarantee would remove any uncertainty about the payoff on your investment so you would accept a lower figure than the uncertain payoff of 4 lakh 20 thousand dollars but how much less if the building has a present value of 3 lakh 75 thousand dollars and the interest rate is 5 percent then pb equal to certain cash flow upon 1.05 equal to 3 lakh 75 thousand dollars and a certain cash flow of 3 lakh 93 thousand 750 dollars in other words a certain cash flow of 3 lakh 93 thousand 750 dollars has exactly the same present value as an expected but uncertain cash flow of four lakh twenty thousand dollars, the cash flow of three lakh ninety three thousand seven fifty is therefore known as the certainty equivalent cash flow to compensate for both the delayed payoff and uncertainty in real estate prices. You need a return of four lakh twenty thousand minus three lakh seventy five thousand that is equal to forty five thousand dollars. One part of this difference compensates for the time value of money. The other part, that is four lakh twenty thousand minus three lakh ninety three thousand seven fifty, which is equal to twenty six thousand two fifty, is a markdown or haircut to compensate for the risk attached to the forecasted cash flow of four lakh twenty thousand dollars. The following example illustrates two ways to value a risky cash flow. First, method one: discount the risky cash flow at the risk adjusted discount rate R, that is greater than R F. The risk adjusted discount rate adjusts for both time and risk. This is illustrated by the clockwise route in the figure shown here. Method 2 Find the certainty equivalent cash flow and discount at the risk free interest rate RF. When you use this method, you need to ask what is the smallest certain payoff for which I would exchange the risky cash flow. This is called a certainty equivalent denoted by CUQ. Since CUQ is the value equivalent of safe cash flow, it is discounted at the risk free rate the certainty equivalent method makes separate adjustments for risk and time and we can see this in the counterclockwise figure shown here thus we have two identical expressions for the pv of a cash flow at the period one first one is pv equal to c1 upon 1 plus r which is equal to certainty equivalent cq upon 1 plus rf for cash flows 2, 3 or t years away, we have PV or present value equal to CT upon 1 plus R raised to the power T equal to CQ upon 1 plus RF raised to the power T. Consider the following example now. Consider two simple projects. Project A is expected to produce a cash flow of $100 million for each of the three years. The risk free interest rate is 6%. The market risk premium is 8% 
and project A's beta is 0 0.75. You therefore calculate A's opportunity cost of capital as shown here. That is R equal to RF plus beta times RM minus RF equal to 6 plus 8 into 0 0.75 equal to 12%. Discounting at 12% gives us the present value for each cash flow as shown here in the table and the overall PV of 240.2. Now compare these figures with the cash flows of project B. Notice that B's cash flows are lower than A's but B's cash flows are safe and therefore they are discounted at the risk free interest rate. The present value of each year's cash flow is identical for the two projects. In year 1 project A has a risky cash flow of 100. This has the same PV as the safe cash flow of 94.6 from project B. Therefore 94.6 is the certainty equivalent of 100. Since the two cash flows have the same PV, investors must be willing to give up 100 minus 94.6 that is equal to 5.4 in expected year 1 income in order to get rid of the uncertainty. In year 2, project A has a risky cash flow of 100 and B has a risky cash flow of 89.6. Again, both flows have the same PV. Thus, to eliminate the uncertainty in year 2, investors are prepared to give up 100 minus 89.6 which is equal to 10.4 of future income. To eliminate uncertainty in year 3, they are willing to give up 100 minus 84.8 which is equal to 15.2 of future income. To value project A, you discounted each cash flow at the same risk adjusted discount rate of 12%. Now you can see that what is employed, implied when you did that. By using a constant rate, you effectively made a larger deduction for risk from the later cash flows. This can also be seen in the table shown here. The second cash flow is riskier than the first because it is exposed to two years of market risk. The third cash flow is riskier still because it is exposed to three years of market risk. This increased risk is reflected in the certainty equivalents that decline by a constant proportion each period. Therefore, use of a constant risk adjusted discount rate for a stream of cash flow assumes that risk accumulates at a constant rate as you look further into the future. To summarize, in this video, we discuss the concept of certainty equivalents C's or CEQs. C's are the certain cash flows that you consider receiving in lieu of a given risky cash flows. Quite obvious to say that they are lower than risky cash flows and thus discounting C's at risk-free rates results in the same equivalent cash flow as when the corresponding risky cash flows are discounted at appropriate discount rate. Through a couple of examples, we have shown how CEs are useful in examining the risky and risk-free cash flow components of a project. This lesson shows us how to apply the cost of capital concept in valuing risky projects. Suppose the project has the same market risk as the company's existing assets. In this case, the project cash flows can be discounted at the company cost of capital. The company cost of capital is the rate of return that investors require on a portfolio of all of the company's outstanding debt and equity. It is usually calculated as an after-tax weighted average cost of capital that is after-tax VAC. That is as the weighted average of the after-tax cost of debt and the cost of equity. The weights are the relative market values of debt and equity. The cost of debt is calculated after tax because interest is a tax deductible expense. The hardest pass part of calculating the after tax VAC is estimation of the cost of equity. Most large public corporations use capital asset pricing model or CAPM to do this. They generally estimate the firm's equity beta from past rates of return for the firm's common stock and for the market and they check their estimate against the average beta of similar firms. The after tax VAC is the correct discount rate for projects that have the same market risk as the company's existing business. Many firms, however, use the after-tax VAC as the discount rate for all the projects. This is a dangerous procedure. If the procedure is followed strictly, the firm will accept too many high-risk projects and reject too many low-risk projects. It is project risk that counts. The true cost of capital depends on the use of which the capital is put. Managers therefore need to understand why a particular project may have above or below average risk. You can often identify the characteristics of a high or low beta project even when the beta cannot be estimated directly. For example, you can figure out how much the project's cash flows are affected by the performance of the entire economy. Cyclical projects are generally high beta projects. You can also look at the operating leverage. Fixed production costs increase beta. Don't be fooled by the diversifiable risk. 
diversifiable risks do not affect asset betas or the cost of capital. But the possibility of bad outcomes should be incorporated in the cash flow forecast. Also be careful not to offset worries about a project's future performance by adding a fudge factor to the discount rate. Fudge factors don't work and they may seriously undervalue long-lived projects. There's one more fence to jump. Most projects produce cash flows for several years. Firms generally use the same risk adjusted rate to discount each of these cash flows. When they do this, they are implicitly assuming that cumulative risk increases at a constant rate as you look further into the future. That assumption is usually reasonable. It is precisely true when the project's future beta will be constant, that is, when risk per period is constant. But exceptions sometimes prove the rule. Be on the alert for projects with risk clearly does not increase steadily. In these cases, you should break the project into segments within which the same discount rate can be reasonably used. Or you should use the certainty equivalence version of DCF model, which allows separate risk adjustment to each period cash flows.